All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back, my fellow Martians, to another episode of Mixed Martian Arts, a podcast where we explore the topics of UAP, the UFC, and World War III. Today being a UFC episode. Now, the last few episodes I've done have been geopolitical, obviously because of the huge events going on in the Middle East right now. I wanted to give that just a little breather. There's plenty of great uh, news content creators that you can follow uh, to cover that subject, and I will be back in the next day or two to address more about what's developing with uh, Israel and Hamas and that entire situation that's been unfolding. It's madness. It's all over the news, but I'm excited to bring you something a little more lighthearted today. It's very heavy to cover topics like that geopolitically in the world that affect so many people's lives. So today is going to be a UFC episode, and all it is going to be covering is the two New fights we got. I mean, unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know at this point that the upcoming UFC pay-per-view next Saturday has done a complete topsy-turny on us. We lost both the main event and the co-main event, the main event being Charles Oliveira versus Islam, and um, it's, uh, where do I even start with this one? So, he, you know, Charles got cut in, I think they said, the fifth round of his sparring for the fight. How unfortunate is that? I saw a picture of it on Instagram. It's a big old cut right over his eyebrow. Now, uh, Dana White was a little pissed when they originally announced it. One, because Charles's team announced it before the UFC got a chance to, uh, that he was pulling out of the fight. And two, because I guess uh, Oliveira went and got it stitched up before contacting the UFC. And Dana said something along the lines of, when they do that, uh, if they contact uh, the UFC before uh, getting it stitched up, whatever like injury they have, whatever cut, I should say, that the, I guess, plastic surgeons are able to somehow stitch it from the inside out. Now, I have no idea how on earth you could stitch something from the inside out on somebody's head. Makes absolutely no sense to me, but apparently there is a way, and I guess it's a way maybe that it heals faster or like it has less of a chance of opening. So perhaps if Oliveira would have gone and done this plastic surgery on his head rather than getting it stitched up from the old outside in, way, uh, we potentially would still have this fight. So who knows about that, but Dana was kind of uh, peeved about that whole thing, and he was not too happy with Oliveira's team uh, for making the announcement for the UFC. It tends to happen all the time. Uh, you got these camps who always talk amongst each other, and you know before you know it, it ends up on social media. So we saw Oliveira is out, and very interesting development. Uh, Alexander Volkanovsky is taking the fight. When he announced that he was taking it, or the UFC announced, I think it was 11 days notice. And this is obviously a rematch. If you guys have not seen the first fight between Islam and uh, I never want to say his last name, Mahavic, Mahaj, I can I can never say it. Islam Mahavic, Maha, Makovic, Maha, I don't know. Islam. Uh, when that fight happened, the first one, I highly recommend. It's on the UFC uh, YouTube page, so you should probably go back and watch it. And uh, I need to go back and watch it myself because it was such a close fight that uh, I remember scoring it in real time. I mean, everybody's had this debate who won that fight. Obviously, Islam won the decision, but a lot of people felt that Volk had actually got it done. Now, it's very interesting because, one, they were both coming on of, coming off of a full training camp for the first fight. And the way that the fights are scored, for me, leaves something to be desired because while I do feel like Islam potentially won more of the rounds, which obviously is the goal, it's hard because you see what Volkanovsky was doing in that fifth round. He knocked down Islam and, you know, had him and, you know, he mounted him and was just ground and pounding the living daylights out of him. And that's how the fight ended with Volkanovsky on top, uh, you know, ground and pounding Islam and it's weird because they don't uh, they don't the criteria the judging criteria the scoring does not kind of account for anything like more towards the end of the fight it's just another round the fifth round if it's a fifth, fifth round fight or uh, the third round if it's a th uh, three round fight they don't account how the fight ends any more with any more gravity or importance than the rest of the fight I've always thought that was such a weird thing because like, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you could be getting beat pillar to post the entire fight, and if you are if you come back and you're almost finishing the dude in the fifth round, well, then, like, the audience is kind of left to believe, okay, if that fight had continued, it's likely that, you know, Volkanovski probably would have gotten that W. And so there's, in my opinion, I guess I'm going off on a tangent here, but there should be, like, more weight put on the fifth round or the last round of the fight, I should say. There should be put more weight put on it how it ends because it's just a... I find it odd that it's like so simple as to it's just a scoring like who won more rounds of the five rounds, whereas like the fifth round is the most important because it's like 
and truthfulness, what actually matters is how a fight ends because that's how it resolves, you know? So it it left the audience very, like, uh, confused about the fight because it's like, okay, on the scorecards, I guess, Islam, you can see the argument of how he won, but then, like, it's hard to... Uh, deny what your eyeballs are seeing in front of you, and that was Volkanovsky winning the end of the fight dominantly and getting close to finishing Islam, in my opinion. So that is what happened in the first fight. Now, as I said, that was coming off of two full training camps, both for Islam and for Volkanovsky. Now, while I am excited about this fight, definitely, I actually wasn't all that hyped up on the Oliveira-Islam rematch and I felt that it was probably going to go the same way it went in the first fight, being Oliveira getting submitted. I think he got submitted in the early into the second round, if I'm not mistaken. Could have been the first, but I'm pretty I'm pretty positive it was into the second round. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But regardless, Oliveira gets submitted, and I I did not see. Although when Oliveira had that fight with Benil Dariush, uh, he he put a pounding on him. I still didn't believe, like, okay, he's going to be able to take out Islam. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It's definitely a fight I would have been intrigued to see, but I wasn't, like, overly excited about that being the main event. So while I am extremely excited for Volkanovski to get that rematch, I wanted that rematch to happen earlier. I don't like the conditions. I got to be honest. I do not like the conditions under which this fight is being fought. Islam's coming off of a full training camp, and while, granted, he did not expect to be fighting Volkanovski, the guy who uh, gave him the hardest or at least one of the hardest fights in his career. I mean, Islam has been KO'd once, so I guess you'd have to say that fight was probably harder than the Volkanovski fight. But regardless, one of the very most difficult opponents he's ever faced was Alexander Volkanovski, and now he's facing him as well on short notice. But I do think Islam has a few advantages over Volkanovski here that is going to potentially present like a big problem, and it's going to leave a bad taste probably in my mouth and others for like, okay, well, if Volkanovski was on a full training camp, this could have gone different. And it just kind of sets up a weird uh, potential scenario of where this could go because well, I I have always thought Volkanovski could beat Islam in the rematch 100%. I would almost favorite Volkanovski. I think he's probably going to be able to adjust. He's one of the best. He he's one of the best guys adjusting on the fly. And to give him on top of that all this time to be able to watch the tape and see what he did wrong in the Islam fight, I I fully expect him being one of the best fighters of all time. Truthfully, I fully expect him to come out with a adjusted game plan and to be able to put it on Islam. I really do. But the coming off the couch in 11 days. Now, the weight cut is not as much of a factor because he's obviously going up in weight class. So Volkanovski is attempting to become double champ yet again, and he's not going to have to cut as much weight. So maybe the weight is not going to be a factor. You know, a fighter taking a fight on short notice, uh, it tends to be that weight cut is going to be what's going to really get them if they're fighting at their natural weight class. But Volkanovski is going up. So I suppose that's not as big of a deal. But what is a big deal is he hasn't been going through the motions. Um, he did just come off of an elbow surgery, according to him. So he was still on the mend up with that. He says he has been sparring for roughly the past four weeks, uh, but I doubt, I truly doubt that he's been in like quote unquote training camp. I mean, he says he's always kind of somewhat active. He said in, in and out of the gym. He's not just laying around like Patty Pimblett eating pizza, but at the same time, I mean, you just have to admit he wasn't expecting to face any opponent within uh, this time frame. So I think it sets up just, I, I think Volkanovski, one of his biggest assets is his uh, cardio, you know, to be able to take into the late rounds. And it, it looks as if he has just got as much in the tank as he did in the first rounds. How is that going to be possible when you don't have that cardio endurance that you've been developing over like what, an eight, eight week training camp? I mean, he's missing that giant ingredient. So I, I wonder if he's going to come out the gate hot trying to finish Islam in the first three rounds, knowing that, you know, as the fight goes on, it's going to be very difficult to get over that mountain with Islam, who has known he's had a fight this entire time. So I don't love that. I got to be honest. And, and if, let me say this, it sets up a great story if Volk, Volkanovski pulls it off. I mean, it sets up an amazing trilogy because then we'll get the full training camp and it's like, dang, Volkanovski just did probably one of the best things in the sports history to ever be done facing this, you know, terrifying champion and beating him on 11 days notice off the couch and becoming Dumbo champ. I mean, that's got to be up there with one of the best things to ever happen in the sport. So if, if it goes his way, uh, you know, hats off to him. I, I'm not going to sit here and be like, wow, you know, that was uh, not a good idea. But I am worried about it because... 
it just makes sense to me that uh, Islam's probably going to win this one, and I fully attribute that to the fact that, uh, you know, likely a huge factor is going to be that he's coming off, Volkanovski's coming off the couch. And if Volk, Volkanovski loses this, let's say he loses a decision, and uh, towards like the fourth and fifth round, Islam's just putting it on him, and we're, we're seeing Volkanovski get tired, well, then it's going to really suck because it's like, man, how there's not going to be a trilogy. And we're never going to know what it was like to have a rematch with a full camp under both, you know, both fighters being healthy and both fighters having a full camp. And it's just going to lead into this weird um, narrative that I just, you know, I'm not a fan of it. So I think it's a giant risk for Volkanovski. I'm here for it. I think it's a better main event than Oliveira in Islam. But I just think from Volkanovski's perspective, I mean, he's a dog. He wants to fight. You can only... Like I said, it's hats off to him regardless because, I mean, it's true champ material to be able to do something like this on 11 days' notice. I mean, not to mention that, but there's a flight to Abu Dhabi. He's got a fly there. That's a huge flight. I don't know how far from Australia, but uh, it's a big flight. Or, I'm sorry, New Zealand, wherever Volkanovski's training right now. Uh, but regardless, it's you got the flight, you got the... the um, not layover. What, what am I? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, he's going to have to adjust after he lands. That flight is going to throw him back. His sleeping schedule is going to be off a little bit. And then, you know, you got to cut weight. Probably not much, but he's going to have to cut a little bit. And then before you know it, he's in a fight. So he, he kind of put it in, in his perspective like uh, this, you know, no pressures on me. I kind of just come off the couch and uh, here I am in the fight. No time to worry. No time for injuries. And that makes sense. We heard uh, Michael Bisping say as much when he faced uh, the rematch in Luke Rockhold. He had like two weeks notice. And he said it ended up being to his benefit because he did, didn't have all the uh, jitters, the, the anxiety you know, of going through an entire full camp knowing what's ahead of you. It's just kind of like a week or two and uh, there you go. You're in a fight. So all in all, Let's just see what happens, but I am going to be pretty disappointed if Volkanovski loses this in a way where we can see. Now, if he gets finishes in the first, finished in the first or second round by Islam, I mean, there's going to be no, you're not going to hear it from me saying like, oh, if he had a full camp, you know, getting knocked out, getting knocked out, or uh, potentially even getting submitted. But if it has anything to do with like endurance, cardio go, drags into the later later rounds, and Volkanovski's kind of just getting held down, it's going to irritate me a little bit. But moving on to the co-main event, we have we had, I should say. Uh, Hazmat Chimayev and Paulo Costa, uh, Paulo Costa, and I was extremely excited for this fight. Man, we've been waiting for this fight for so long, and I think Chael and others have rightfully said there was always something that felt kind of off with this fight. It kind of felt like uh, this isn't going to ha happen, and even when it got scheduled, it got scheduled, uh, I forget how many months out, I think like three, and it just seemed like, okay, something's going to happen. There's going to be an injury or... You know, something is just, it didn't feel right, and it turns out it wasn't right, and that Polo Costa was coming off of an elbow surgery uh, for some, I don't I think it was like some sort of infection. Uh, the picture was pretty nasty. His uh, elbow was like inflamed and red, and I guess he had a surgery, then he has to have another surgery, then he has to have a third surgery. So he did make it all the way out to Abu Dhabi and was training. So it really sucks from his perspective because he was getting ready for the fight. You know, he was doing what he could do. You're, you're not going to, I think some people are going to assume uh, Paulo Costa was scared or didn't think he could win the fight. So we backed out. I think that's absolutely foolish. Uh, for one, you're not going to go fly all the way to Abu Dhabi and just to pull out if you you know don't want to face uh, Hazmat. So uh, sucks, really sucks, because I wanted that fight. I was looking forward to that fight. I don't even know who I'd favor in that fight. I think if anybody could beat uh, Chemayev, I think Paulo Costa is probably that guy. And uh, from Chamayo's perspective, had he beat Polo Costa, I think he's ready for a title fight. You know, 100%, I think he's ready for a title fight. And that's an interesting matchup with Sean Strickland. And it, it just would have been an interesting uh, timeline, you know, to see what happens after that fight, you know. And if Polo would have won, I think probably he deserves a title shot. Although being he did already have one, so uh, that's kind of dicey. But definitely if Chamayo won, he deserves it. Now, Polo's out. And his replacement is none other than Kamaru Usman. You guys probably know that. I'm not breaking any news because I'm like a week late on this. Uh, but this is kind of a similar circumstance than the Volkanovski fight in a way. Um, Volkanovski is on fight in a way, but with all kinds of different ingredients. One being Kamaru Usman. This is his first time going up to 185. His ability to become champion again at 170 is obviously kind of slim to none. 
I, I shouldn't say slim to none because you got Leon and Colby fighting at the end of this year. And if Colby were to beat Leon, let's say dominantly, and it, it merits no rematch, then while well, naturally, hey, Kamar Usman has beat Colby Covington twice, so it makes sense. Got to do the trilogy for the belt. And as I'm saying that in real time, I'm thinking, shit, you know, uh, maybe Usman should probably just waited for that fight. But him facing Chimaev. I think the way he probably sees it is that, one, he he has beat Sean Strickland. Some people don't know that, uh, but he did uh, beat Sean Strickland in, I believe, a unanimous decision uh, all the way back in, I don't even know what year, maybe 2017, not sure. It was a while ago, but Kamaru Usman has beat the current champion, Sean Strickland, at 185. So I think probably in Kamaru Usman's uh, mindset, and we have heard from the UFC as much, whoever wins this fight, barring any injuries or weird circumstances, is going to get the title fight. So even if it's Usman, this being his first fight at 185, beating Chimaev, which in my opinion is a giant task, and uh, Chimaev is definitely one of the top contenders in the division, I do think with Kamaru's resume and the fact that he's taking it on short notice... Again, the weight cut not really going to be a factor as much since he's going up to 185, but the coming off the couch in 11 days, coming off of two pretty bad losses to Leon Edwards, losing the belt, and now he's in a uh, number one contender's fight with debatably one of the scariest fighters in the UFC who has been training this entire time. Now he is coming off a long layoff, Chimaev. The last time we saw him was Gilbert Burns, which was like, what? I don't even know at this point, a year and a half almost, has to be almost a year and a half. So it's been a long time for him, and to Kamaru's point, he has been active. I mean, he's been losing, but he's been actively losing. So it's interesting matchup, interesting. Uh, Kamaru's got, I think they said he's got like a 97% takedown defense. The only person to ever take him down in the UFC, at least, is Leon Edwards, supposedly, which is very odd. The kickboxer is the only one to take down the wrestler. Very strange. But that is, uh, it is true to say that he's got amazing takedown defense. Now, Chimaev coming off a lang- long layoff, but I mean, I've been watching some of his training footage. I mean, he looks ready. He looks really ready. And Kamaru Usman is not going to be bigger than Chimaev. He's going to be smaller, I think, by a pretty significant margin, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't seen them face off yet, but yeah, I would imagine that uh, Kamaru Usman is going to be pretty outsized. Kamaru, you know, very much so relies on his cardio and his endurance. He, he's another one of those guys like Volkanovski who never really seems to gas in the later rounds, but he's coming off of a, you know, no training camp. So I don't, it just adds in some weird factors and it's either going to pay off really well or, you know, I can also see Kamaru unfortunately getting finished uh, brutally uh, due to one, just the size difference with Chmaev, no training camp. Just so many factors. We guys, you guys know, uh, Usman's knees are trash. So the fact that he's even still competing is insane. And the fact that he's now competing, you know, at the top of 185 is insane. Now, if he does lose, is he losing anything? I guess not, because potentially he could go right back down to 170 and see if Colby wins. If Colby wins, boom, give the man a title shot. He deserves it. He's got the uh, resume for it 100%. And he would deserve that trilogy without a doubt. Unless, uh, you know, the leon Kobe fight was extremely close. It'd have to be like something back and forth war. And then like somebody edges out a decision. And so they say, oh, immediate rematch, you know. But regardless, if Kobe ends up winning whatever goes on in that whole debacle, then I think Kamara merits the title shot, even if he does lose. So I guess it's, as long as he doesn't get injured or finished, then I I guess it's a wise move. I guess for Kamara Usman, it's a wise move. Now, Chemayev obviously has to face an opponent that he wasn't expecting, and uh, a completely different fight, true, truly. I mean, Usman and Paul Acosta are not even similar in their fighting style. So it's a different opponent, but I just think the advantage uh, has to go to Chmaev, being the fact that he's had a full training camp and been ready, and he's probably in the best shape of his life, whereas Kamaro, it's impossible to say he's in the best shape of his life. It's literally impossible. So let's see how it plays out. It is interesting if Kamaro wins this. Let's say Kamaro wins over Chmaev. I just don't favor him to, for that fight. Truthfully, I do not. Maybe even if he was on a full training camp, I don't think I favor him. I think Chmaev is just giant. He's just big. And it's just a tough fight. Not saying he couldn't win it, but I don't think uh, the odds are in his favor. But nonetheless, let's say he somehow gets past Chmaev and then fights Sean Strickland for the belt at 185 and beats Sean Strickland. And then in a hypothetical world, Colby beats Leon. And now you have... 
You could, in, in a strange universe that is plausible, you could see Kamar Usman holding two belts at the same time in the next year. It is 100% true. He could beat Sean Strickland, and he could go back down and fight Kobe for a trilogy should Kobe get past Leon. Now, there's a lot of ifs and buts and maybes in that, so we'll have to just kind of wait and see. Overall, I'm excited about the card. I would have been very disappointed had this card fallen apart with the main event and co-main, and they still just kind of went with it or replaced the opponents with um, somebody of lesser caliber. You know, Kamar Usman being a former champ, Volkanovski being a current champ who had a uh, amazing fight, amazing display uh, previously with uh, Islam. So great fights. It's just the factors that kind of irritate me and make me feel like uh, in hindsight, like if we see Kamaru get finished and Volkanovski get finished or or just lose in a dominant way, we're all going to sit here and be like, man, that. Like, it's, it wasn't really fair. It wasn't fair, and it would have been better to see these on full training camps. But that is the sport, and had we lost the main and coming event and there was going to be no good replacements, that would have really sucked. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to get to Islam right now, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, and apparently both of them were offered the fight, or at least Dustin, we know, was offered the fight and uh, wasn't able to accept it. So who would have known? Who else could have potentially filled that spot if uh, Volkanovski didn't fill the main event and uh, Kamar Usman didn't fill the co-main event? That's very interesting to speculate on, but nonetheless, it is what it is. Now, I guess the last thing we'll say for wrapping up today's episode is the fact that USADA, uh, the anti-doping drug administration, I guess you want to say, uh, that prevents steroid use in the UFC is gone. I guess their contract is going to be over in January, and it looks like they had some sort of a falling out with the UFC and Dana White in general. And supposedly this revolves around the Conor McGregor drama with Conor McGregor needing to have a six-month clean uh, testing period before he's able to even enter into the USADA pool. I think there was a lot of uh, shenanigans behind the scenes, and uh, the UFC was probably trying to skirt that in any way saying that, you know, you don't need to really test the man for six months. Come on, just look the other way. He's going to test clean. So what's the difference? He doesn't have to do it for six months before he then tests clean and is able to enter the pool. Now, from USADA's perspective, I don't know all the ins and outs, so maybe somebody can kind of update me. But from USADA's perspective, I mean, they're just kind of following their regulations, right? And they weren't making an exception for anybody. Just because you're Conor McGregor doesn't mean you're allowed to do roids, which he clearly was on. Uh, now, I don't want to discuss the morality of that. He was coming off of like a devastating injury and without steroids or whatever shit he's on, probably was never going to be able to make a return. So I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with it as long as you're in the off season, you're not fighting. Now, the testing for six months thing, I don't know all the science behind it. Like, how long would it be technically fair for you to have steroids out of your system before you can get back into competition? I don't know. I would assume USADA probably knows more than the UFC, but UFC, uh, I would imagine, it was probably pressuring USADA to kind of um, make a exception, and USADA probably didn't want to. Uh, bad words were probably said on both sides. It looks like they're having a falling out and uh, they're being replaced by some other organization. I forget their name, I think in January. So end of the day, I don't find it to be like huge news, but you know, they try to bend the rules from McGregor. Didn't seem to work out. Mm, maybe there's more to it than meets the eye, but from the uh, layman's perspective, that is kind of, it looks like that's what happened. So anyway, I will do a full card uh, prediction and breakdown here. The fight is next. the The card is next Saturday, so maybe like Monday, Tuesday. I'm sorry, what's today? So, mo today's Monday. Good lord. So maybe like uh, Wednesday, Thursday. I'll do a breakdown and some predictions. Maybe we'll have a guest on and uh, go from there, guys. But I appreciate y'all for tuning in. I need your help to grow this freaking thing. Uh, this is a podcast, but I do post it on YouTube. I do post it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addict, all of that, even TikTok clips at Mixed Martial Arts. Uh, if you would be so uh, kind, just click subscribe. It helps me grow this thing, and I really want to reach 1,000 subscribers so I can go live and chat with you guys rather than just do these monologues. I need your help to do that. So click the subscribe, click the notification bell. I've never said that before, but I saw other people do it. I suppose I should too. So click the notification bell so that anytime I upload a video, it will bing on your phone and you will get an update and you will see it on your feed. So that's a way to help me. That's free, simple, and easy. Uh, last thing I'll say is if you guys want to be a part of the conversation on a daily basis, I have a mixed martial arts discord group in the description to this video. You can find the link and it's only got like, I don't know, 17, 18 members, but people from all over the place, we like to talk about uh, the subject. So I've got UFC subgroup a uh, UFO subgroup and a World War III geopolitical subgroup where we share news, ask questions, share our experiences, our interests in these topics. And it's fun to just be able to connect and chat with people who like 
care about following the same stuff as you. It's kind of uh, lonely if you just watch other people on podcasts and you don't talk with anybody about um, you know things you're interested in. So maybe you care about UFOs, but you don't care about UFC. That's okay. That's why I have three groups uh, in that Mixed Martial Arts Discord. So if you guys are listening to the audio format on Spotify, whatever, just click follow, leave me a five-star review. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, my fellow Martians. I'll be back probably tomorrow with another episode potentially geopolitically related since it seems like the entire world may be destroyed soon, so I should probably cover that. All right, peace out, y'all. Have a good day. Bye.